it's that 15 minute bell and just lets us know because i'm once i get going you guys know i talk i got you okay so so this is what i wanted to cover today and we'll open up in prayer as soon as i'm done but um revelation four and five is really setting the stage for everything that's going to happen in the book of revelation and a lot of people gloss over this because they want to get to six and the actual future events that happen but this takes us back and forth into Daniel and Ezekiel and really, really, like I said, sets the stage. And Revelation 4 and Revelation 7 are really big for you to understand those themes of a wedding and a trial going on. Because if you don't understand those themes, you get a lot of stuff mixed up because you know a trial has a clear order to it and a wedding has a clear order to it. So those two themes help you nail down everything else when there's a discrepancy in this person's theory and that person's theory, because when you keep those two things in, in mind, you're like, well, no, this has to be first, this has to be in the middle, this has to be last, you know, in a general sense. So um, do one of you guys want to open us up in prayer and we'll get started? I'll do it. All right. Father God, we come before you. Thank you for another time of fellowship and asking that you help us hear your word. And we thank you and ask that you continue to put a hedge of protection around us as the word goes out and that whoever hears this receives and receives your word and is edified by it, Father. We just thank you and bless the person that's speaking and, and reading from your word and helping us uh, all receive what you have for us today. And we love you. And we thank you for sending your son to down the cross for our sins. And we thank you for forgiving us of our sins. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So um, why don't we start here then? And we'll have one of you guys just go ahead and clear all of chapter four. And I think that's it for starters. Let's just start with that. Volunteer. Hey, Tyson, do you got it or you need me to get it? I'll take it. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of. Um, you got the I'm voice, Jamie, girl. Uh, all right, cool. <laughs> all right. Revelation chapter four. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and 20 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face of it as a man. And the fourth, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the, fourth, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying holy 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 lord god almighty which was and is and is to come and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever the four and twenty elders fall before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay, so if you had to just summarize this scene, what does what that what does that pop at you? What is, what does it seem like is happening? 
Well, John is caught up in the spirit and he's basically in the throne room where the elders are worshiping uh, Christ. Okay, so the one seated on the throne, right? Correct. Okay, so remember how we talked about the things that were already, that's the kingdom come in the spiritual sense, and now he's saying these are the things which must be hereafter, right? Correct. So obviously we're, we're getting ready to do the things hereafter. That's what we're setting the stage for. The one who sits on the throne in heaven, he says he, he, he was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. I just want to show you guys what those look like here. Um, jasper, if you remember me always saying this, is that the New Jerusalem's jasper? Uh-huh. Those are sardines kind of reddish too. So they're these two reddish, orangish kind of blood-colored stones. That's the, the look of the one who sat on the throne from a distance, apparently. He's looking at him. And then there's a, a emerald rainbow roundabout. So kind of Christmassy looking. And then he says, um, there's 24 seats. Now, can you guys think of anything where it mentions thrones or seats anywhere else in the Bible? Well, you have the seat of Moses. That's the judgment seat of Moses, right? Okay. Was that a literal seat or was that a figurative seat? Uh, you know, that's a, in Jerusalem, they have a seat of Moses. Do you remember who sat on the seat of Moses? Jesus uh, in the gospel. I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm thinking the Pharisees did, but uh, I'm not sure. Right. That's what he calls them out, is that they sit in the seat of Moses. In other words, they're claiming to have the judiciary authority of Moses to adjudicate what's the penalty of the law or what's the law say in this situation, right? Essentially, they're a judge. So you're on the right track. Um, can anybody think of any other places where you have thrones or seats in the Bible? Um, you got the apostles sitting on 12 seats judging the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. So now what we're, we're starting to develop a theme here. What does that look like then? Judgment. Judgment. Okay. Can you think of we, any other thrones or seats? Um, the throne of David. The throne of David. Who sits on that? Christ. Christ. Okay. Um, um the seat um, when the Antichrist sits in the seat in the temple. Yeah. What What's that seat called? The one in the temple is the mercy seat, right? The mercy seat. Yep. What else? Can you think? There's There's still more. We're developing a theme here. Think about other seats and thrones. We have a Bema seat. Is that right? The Bema seat. And what's that represent? Uh, gifts. Gifts and rules. Uh, uh, we're... we're we're being judged. Uh, we're being judged. This is a legal type issue. Right. So, so you see a consistent theme, right? So one of the things we need to know is that a king in the Old Testament sense was also your Supreme Court high judge. So go all the way back to Moses. Jethro is telling him he's judging too much stuff. So he counsels him to set up elders underneath him to help him judge the smaller stuff. And then the bigger stuff they'd take to him, okay? And those elders underneath them, remember how many there were? Seven. Seventy. Seventy, right? What do you think that represents? The nations. Right. So if if Moses is replaced by who? Joshua. Well. Uh, oh, the set. Uh, well, he, the well, he he picked out the. Uh, 50s, 10s, and 100s uh, to judge. Right, but so, so you said the right thing, Randy. What's a, what's another way of saying Joshua in Greek? Jesus. Jesus, right? Yeah, that's, cool. that's why J Joshua followed Moses. So um, so the, the new prophet after Moses is Jesus, right? So who's the new 70? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. Also known as the, the church. The church, right? So, 
so we're getting this theme here of of God judging or Christ judging the big things, Moses judging the big things, but delegating the smaller things to judge. Does he do that with us? Yeah, I, I believe so. We're uh, given rule with him over the nations. Right. What about what does it say in the book, book of Corinthians about our judging? I believe we'll judge the angels. We'll judge the angels, right? And he said, how much more can you judge the small matters among yourselves, right? Correct. Right. right. So so that's a number of themes we have here. Uh, there's one that you guys missed that I'm going to just take you to, but you got almost all of them, just so you know. And that is a, a specific scene in the book of Daniel. So this is Daniel 7, verse 9. And this is the same passage where he they first introduced the little horn that speaks great things. So... So what does the little horn speaking great things represent? Antichrist. Doing what? He's a blossoming God saying, I am God. Right. So what's that going to look like? Uh, we're going to see him in the, the temple, the holy of the holies. Uh, you know, you're not in charge. I am. Right. Right. So that is the that's the abomination of desolation right there. And that's what he's going to do. Now, the, these these two things are going to be intertwined in Daniel and Revelation because they take place in eternity, but also on the earth in time. So you're going to see things in Daniel that are going to be all right next to each other. But in the book of Revelation, they're going to be spread throughout the book of Revelation. OK, because you're dealing with in, eternity intersecting with time. So so he knows this. In Daniel, there's this little horn who's speaking blasphemy. So that's his first kind of mystical allusion to the abomination of desolation. And then he says, I beheld till thrones were cast down. A better word would be set down. That word can be set down, which is the exact term we have. Um, it says the seat up, it says around the throne were 24 seats. And upon the seats, uh, I saw 24 elders sitting. sitting. Um I thought it was somewhere where it said set down, but um, I could be mistaken. It might be later. Um, anyways, he's saying these thrones are set down. And it says, oops. Sorry about that. It says, I beheld thr till thrones were set down and the ancient of days did sit. Do we have an ancient of days sitting in the where we just were? Uh-huh. The one sitting on the throne, right? Whose garment was white as snow and hair of his head was like pure wool. Is that in Revelation? Uh -huh. Okay. And his around his throne was like a fiery flame and wheels as burning fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousands and thousands ministered to him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. So what does it sound like they're doing there? Um, judging, judging. Right, give, give, what does this look like? What, what, will we, what will we compare this to in our world? Trial, right? Right, when, when a trial starts, what happens first? All the judges yeah. sit on they sit on the bench. Right. So who who are the first people to come in, in into the trial? The jury. You've got right? the accuser and the defendant, uh, and they're gonna give their sides. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're going forward a little bit too much. So that's that's some some stuff has gotta happen before they just get up there and start arguing, right? Yeah, so I'm not familiar. Yeah, so in, in a court proceeding, first thing you need to do is you need to have the jury come in and sit down, okay? That's the judgment set, seating, okay? Because what is the jury going to judge? Guilt. Right, whether or not they're found guilty, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And what's the judge going to judge? Sentence. What's the penalty if they are found guilty, right? So 
when you go into a court proceeding, the first thing they're going to do, if let's, let's say Tyson, I'm putting you on trial. Okay. Uh -huh. So you come in and you, you're, you're sat down. Okay. And the prosecutor is sitting down next to you and his witnesses or plaintiff, or if it's a lawsuit, he, you know, whoever's against you. Right. Uh -huh. and you both are sitting there and basically the judge sits down and this is, this court is now in session. The very first thing they're going to do is say, this is the law. The law says before you're accused of anything, pursuant to this law, now you've been accused. So in other words, you got to know, the, the court has to know what the law is before they can accuse you of breaking it. Does that make sense? Correct. Yeah, that makes sense. That you have to establish the authority on which you have been brought in the court to be judged. So we have this law here. And that's the first thing you're explaining to the jury because your jury is just people off the street, right? Right. They're not lawyers. They might not even know what the law is. So the idea is, is that these are regular people just like you. And so we tell those people, here is our law. And Tyson has been accused of breaking that law. Or, or maybe here is our law and this person is suing Tyson because... He cut their hair and he nipped their ear and now their ears deformed, <laughs> right? Right. You, you, you got it. <laughs> so so the, the judgment seating is the jury sitting down. What does the books being open, do you think, represent? Evidence. What's that? Evidence. That's one of it because that's my, what these books we're going to have at the end of the book of Revelation. And one of them is going to be all your deeds and stuff, right? But what's right. the first book they open got to be? The law. The law, law. itself, right? Yeah. The, the law that gets broken so that person can be accused, right? Right. Uh -huh. At a minimum. Now, most people, if I say the law, what are they going to think? The Old Testament law. Right. But who's on trial here? I'll give you a hint. The And the books were open. And I beheld because of the voice of the great words of the horn which he spake, and I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. The beast. Satan's right. on trial. Satan's on trial, right? Yeah. That's the Antichrist, right? Yep. So so there that's what's going down. So what does this law have to be? In order to condemn who who's locked up at the end of the book of Revelation? Antichrist, the, the uh, Satan. Oh, Satan's uh, locked up for a right. thousand years, so, right? He's so in order tied to, up in to lock up Satan, can can you accuse Satan of breaking the law of Moses? No. Wow. No. The law was not given. You, you can't break a law unless there is a law. Right. Was was the law of Moses ever meant to apply to angels? No. 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 Okay. So we need a law that applies to angels, right? Right. And, and uh -huh. Judge Satan. Okay. So when the books are open, the very first book has got to contain a law that Satan breaks, right? Uh -huh. Right. Okay. So now we're going to go back to Revelation. We're just going to kind of keep that in our mind. We're going to get through the end of this and then we're going to read the next chapter. Okay. Cool. So, so then he says, Around the thrones were four and twenty seats. What do you think these four and twenty are? Twenty-four. Twenty-four elders. Okay, who are they? A lot of contention about who these are. <laughs> I don't find it difficult at all. The twelve patriarchs and the and the twelve apostles. Right. Why are they the jury? Well, the first covenant was given to the, the twelve tribes of Israel. And right. then this, the second covenant came through the 12 apostles. Right. And what, what is being judged there back in Daniel? Do you remember? It says he, well, here. Yeah, uh, he was doing uh, boastful things. The little right. horn was, had a big mouth. It says, and there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, okay? So that's, um, 
this is this is the when he sees the vision and then the, if you go down further the angel explains the vision and he says of the same thing he says until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom and he said the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom that shall be diverse and devour the whole earth and tread it down and then it says, and he will speak words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given of his hands to the time, time and dividing of time. When's that? The midpoint. Right. But the judgment will sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it until the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all, all dominions shall serve and obey him. So what is the kingdom? Remember how we said there's two kingdom comes, right? This right. is a physical kingdom, the, the fulfillment, not right. just spiritual. So we just, we just read about the history of the spiritual kingdom come, right? Uh-huh. Who started the spiritual kingdom come? Christ. And who'd he delegate that authority to? Um, John the Baptist? No. Nope. Oh, no, no. He delegated to, uh, to the apostles. Right. And Michael, you said, what did he say to the apostles about thrones? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that they would sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Right. So, who did God promise the physical kingdom to? Uh, the apostles. No, the, the physical kingdom. Israel. Oh, 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 Israel. There you go, Israel. And yep. who was that broken up and delegated to? The 12 tribes. The 12 tribes, right? So, you have a division. You have the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. One is over the material kingdom, one's over the spiritual kingdom, and it's all becoming one now. So that's why you have 24. Uh, Consequently, if you want to cheat on this, just read to the end of the book, and it gives you all their names because they're all written on the New Jerusalem. I don't know how anybody in the world can confuse that, but they do. They argue over it. And, and the reason is, is because they're trying to make this the rapture. And they're trying to say that the 24 elders are representative of the church and heaven. They got all these convoluted things. But it literally is just like, who has authority to judge the church? Who has authority to judge Israel, right? And of course, in the resurrection, right? Who's going to be in charge of the 12 tribes of Israel? Their forefathers, right? Right. When they're resurrected, right? And of course, in the church, when the church is all resurrected, who's going to be at the head of the church? Right. The apostles, right? Christ, of course, is the head, but the apostles, you know, next to him. So, mm -hmm. so they're taking away his dominion, and that dominion, then, if if their if their dominion is Israel, the kingdom of Israel, then the dominion they're taking away from Antichrist is the kingdom of Israel, right? Um, yeah, got it. <laughs> yeah, pretty simple. So the yeah. people are just like, it's not about Israel; it's about Islam. Is like, no, Islam never had the kingdom. Um. Right. So it says that uh, on their heads they had crowns of gold, and they proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were lamps of fire, uh, which were the seven spirits of God. And before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal. This is important to me. It's going to come up later on. They're in the New Jerusalem, which is this big floating cubicle city, and there's a glass floor in the throne room. I think they can just see right down into earth. That's that's what I see. Anyways, in the midst of the throne, right about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The, the first was like a lion, second like a calf, third was like a beast, like a face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. So these four things actually have their um, insignia on, you ever see the thing when Chuck Missler does where the um, 12 tribes of Israel are arrayed like a, a cross in the wilderness? Yeah, I've seen that. Okay, uh -huh. so the the four people who are on the four points of the cross, I think it's like Judah, Dan, Ephraim, and um, I forget who the fourth is, but that's their insignias in terms of what was on their flags. 
And then, of course, typically, what, what does a lion usually represent? King. King. What gospel do you think represents the lion? I want to I say, was it Mark? Or was that the man? Hmm. What one focuses on his royal lineage the most? Luke. Matthew. 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 Because it gives you the lineage member, right? Yeah. From David down to him. And then um, Mark focuses mostly on what David did. Or I'm sorry, what Jesus did versus mm -hmm. what he thought. Um, some people say that's the, the calf because that represents his service, the actual doing. Luke is the one that focuses the most on his manhood, who he is in the flesh, because it focuses on his mother, his physical, his childhood. And then it also gives the most details about his death. And then John focuses on the spirit. So you have the lion, the calf, the man, and the eagle. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so these four beasts seem to be like primary angels that are subordinate to, to God. I don't really know that much more about him. I speculate this theory that they're bound to the four forces of the physical universe. Um, I talked about that in one of my recent videos, but it's just a theory. You know, I, there's nothing, there's not a whole lot said about these guys, but they're also in Ezekiel. They talk about these four things with wheels within wheels and stuff like that. These seem to be a different vision of these same spiritual beings. So whatever they are, they seem to be the connection between God and the physical universe. That's what it seems to be. And so the physical universe gives what to the Lord? Glory. Right. The heavens declare his majesty, right? So it talks about these ones. And, and that's what I, I didn't really... I've never really understood this until more recently because it's like these beings are just constantly saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, Lord God of money who was and is and is to come, right? Mm -hmm. I think they, they're, they're always awake. They're always watching and they're probably sovereign over the physical forces of the universe, which is giving glory to God. And so that's why it says these beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever. That's their job is there to make the universe give glory to God, right? So that's why I kind of put them in connection between the four physical forces that control the physical universe. Um, and then, of course, the 24 elders, when they do that, the 24 elders fall down and give glory to him who worships forever and ever in their throne. They say, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. And that's why it seems like there's a connection with a physical creation here. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. So it seems to be like this is the spiritual unveiling of what the creation is doing in giving God glory. And of course, these uh, 24 elders represent the leadership of those who are about to inherit all that when it finally gets taken away from Satan. Does that make sense? So needless to say, they're, 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 they're happy. So now, so, so that's the courtroom being set up. So what did we read in Daniel happens after the courtroom is set up? The books are open. The books are open. So anyone want to guess how many books there are? <laughs> Just want to name some of the books that we can think about in the Bible. Book of life. Book of life or the book of the living, right? The Lamb's Book of Life. Yeah. Do you think there's a difference between the Book of Life and the Lamb's Book of Life? You bet. What's the difference? Uh, everybody born is in the Book of Life, but a subset is in the Lamb's Book. What ha what has to happen? Uh, these are people that bow the knee to their Lord uh, and Savior Jesus. Right. So let me ask you this. Do people get written in the book of life or are they blotted out of the book of life? Blotted out. Blotted out. So if all the unbelieving are block, blocked out of the book of life, what do you have left? Or blotted out, what do you have left? Believe it. Just one book. The Lamb's book of life, right? Yeah, just one book. Right. So, so the Lamb's book of life is what is left after all the unbelieving are blotted out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay, so there's that's one book. 
Can you think of any other books that the Bible mentions? Book of the Law. Book of the Law. That's the Old Covenant, right? Uh-huh. Who's subject to being judged by the Book of the Law? Those who are under it. Right. Who's that? The nation of Israel. Anyone okay. that got circumcised under that law? Who is not subject for being judged by the book of the law? The Gentiles. No, Those who are uh, no that's what he was saying earlier. This is like celestial beings. Well, the celestial beings are not, but... They are not. How does a Jew get out from being judged by the by the book of the law? By believing on Christ. Right. right. So you're judged by the law unless you're in Christ. Then you're judged by what? Paul says this in Romans. Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness, or in other words, the gospel, right? Right. So Paul says the secret thoughts of men will be judged according to my gospel, right? Right. So in terms of the laws that we know of now, there's a law by which people in Christ are judged, which is the gospel. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no condemnation, but there are rewards, right? Right. So that's your beam of judgment, right? Then there are people who are outside of Christ and judged by the law. Are there rewards with that? <laughs> oh. No, no, because they're not gonna. Nope. Right. Not gonna what happens stand. when you keep the law pretty well, though? You end you up uh, going before the white throne judgment in the end, and it's not good. Right. Well, what happens to you in this life if you keep the law? You get blessed in this life. Right. You get a long life, right? Right. Yeah. But what happens at the end? You you're done. You're done. Right. That's it. That's why the law was meant to perish, and you needed a new new covenant, right? So, so all humanity is going to be judged by the law of sin and death or by the, the gospel, okay? And then we just mentioned the third law that we need to judge who? The celestial, uh, like yeah. Satan. Satan, angels. right? Basically, right. basically angels, right? Because remember, we will judge angels, right? Right. So we need a law by which to judge the angels, right? So he says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne written within and on the backside of seven seals and a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? What do you guys think is in that book? Uh, the judgment of Satan. The judgment of the angels? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so what, what do we notice about this book? Did, you guys, did any of you guys get a chance to try to research that and see if you can find it in the Old Testament? Mm -mm. Uh, Zechariah talks about a flying scroll, okay. double-sided writing. You did your homework, huh? No, uh, yeah, I, I love Zechariah. Okay, so what, what do you remember what chapter that is? Uh, it's about midway. It's one of the visions. Okay, it's Zechariah 5. And just so you guys know, when you're, when you're looking at all the imagery and the actual scenarios that are going on in the, in the book of... Uh, Revelation, the three main books that are going to be quoted in it are going to be Ezekiel, Daniel, and Zechariah. There's a lot of other stuff that are quoted like once or twice, but Ezekiel, Zechariah, and Daniel are going to be quoted over and over and over and over again. And what do, what do all those books have in common? Do you know? They're all prophets. Yeah. What period? Uh, the Babylonian captivity. Right. So Ezekiel would have probably written first. He was in the northern, or no, I believe he was, I believe Ezekiel and Daniel both went out at the same time. They were in the captivity when a bunch of people were taken away, but they were both there when Jerusalem was destroyed. And then Zechariah is going to be when the temple's being rebuilt. Okay. So that context is important. Now, Zechariah 5, he says this. So, so how, Randy, how did you know that that scroll was the scroll from Zechariah? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it, it's basically a mystery and, uh, you know, it just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how I got that. 
Okay. Well, probably the Holy Spirit just revealed it to you, but here, here's your here's your clue. So in Zechariah or in um, chapter five, oops, I'm sorry, Zechariah five and Revelation five. Uh, it says it's written within and on the back side and sealed with seven seals. So it's written in on both sides, right? Uh, it's a scroll, which means that it's writing on the outside and writing on the inside, right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's two scrolls in the whole Old Testament that are written on on both sides, and this is one of them in Zechariah. And they just call it a flying robe, depending on your translation, it's a flying scroll. Does someone want to read Zechariah 5, 1 through 4? Yeah, I can try. Okay. Then I turned and lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, what seest thou? And I said, I see a flying roll. The length here is 20 cubits and the breadth there of 10 cubits. And he, then he said unto me, this is the curse that goes forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that seeth shall be cut off as uh, on this side, according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on the side, on that side, according to it. And I'll bring forth, said the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of a thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of the house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Okay, so who does this scroll apply to? Sounds like the Antichrist. Why so, that? Because he um, says, um, well, more so Satan slash Antichrist, because enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that swear falsely by my name it's that part. Be, how, how do we know it applies? Well, well, let me ask you this. How do we know it doesn't apply specifically to men? Uh, it actually could be applicable to both. Why? Just like, you know, the Pharisees, like Christ called them, you know, the children of, you know, Satan, like those who are under his influence and those who, you know, subscribe to his mindset they're they are under that judgment okay where's it going where's the scroll going the entire world right it's flying right mm -hmm. if this were given to man would it fly through the air no who's in this, charge of uh, angels are in the firmament Right. And then it says it goes forth over the face of the whole earth. So it's it's going in the earth over the face of the whole earth, right? And then it does it say every man will be cut off? No, everyone. Right. Let's see what it says. Over the face of the whole earth. And it just says for Ganab to thieve. So for to thieve. So really it's the one that steals. Okay. So it's not specifying a human being here. Okay. It's flying through the air over the face of the earth. And it says whoever steals. So does man already have a law that says you shouldn't steal? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So does man already have a law that says you shouldn't swear falsely? Yes. So does God need to give us a redundant law to judge men for doing that? No. no. No, we already have that, right? That's old and new covenant, right? Correct. So what remains is this is going to judge angels. Angels, 
What 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 might an angel steal? Think about the Bible. Think about the whole Bible. What might an angel steal? Satan has the earth, so that was stolen. Right. Who did it belong to? Uh, Adam, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, right? Do you remember what, okay, you guys mentioned how the Pharisees were the sons of Satan, right? Right. Do you remember what the parable said about when the guy planted a vineyard and then lent it out to husbandmen? And then he, they, they beat up his servants whenever they sent him. And then he said, I'm going to send my son. They'll respect him. What did they say in their hearts about his son? It's the son. Let's take they're, it. And steal yeah, the inheritance. Right. Let's kill the heir and the, the inheritance will be ours. ours. So what does Satan want to do in mankind? Steal, Satan. kill, destroy. Right. Steal is one of them. Steal, kill, and destroy, right? He wants to take our inheritance, right? Or Christ's okay. inheritance because he's our head. And so he says, um, he goes over the face of the whole earth and him that steals will be cut off as on this side according to it. And then one that um, everyone that swears shall be cut off on that side according to it, okay? So there's two specific things that they're not supposed to do, lie and steal. And Satan does both those things, right? Right. Um, but obviously... Just like all of our righteousness is fulfilled in Christ's single life of righteousness, all Satan's wickedness is going to be fulfilled in the righteous in the wickedness of a certain lawless one. Okay. Uh, so Christ had two comings, right? Who was the Antichrist in his first coming? Judas. Judas. And what did Judas do? Uh, he took 30 pieces of silver. He betrayed Jesus. Mm -hmm. What is he, What was that? Go ahead. Uh, I mean, he's a thief in some way. Uh, right. He remember he what stole. He was known for doing. He's, he's a thief. Uh, he stole. He stole. Right. And then, of course, he betrays Jesus with a kiss. Right. right. And he's into the money bag. Right. So he's not lying in the active sense, but he's kind of deceitful in the passive sense, right? Right. Now, fast forward to the second Antichrist. What does he do? What does he attempt to steal? Glory of God. Right. He goes in the temple and declares that he's God. Right. So what is he really trying to take possession of? The throne, the throne of God. And by virtue of the throne, kingdom. the kingdom, kingdom. right? Mm -hmm. He's trying to take Christ's inheritance, which is the promised land that was promised to the seed of Abraham. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. right. right. So that was Abraham's heir. The seed is Christ. And that was his land that was promised. Okay. So he's trying to take his land and he's going to do it by how? What is he going to do? Lie. Right. What is he going to lie and say? I am God. I am God. He's going to he he's going to claim to be their Messiah, and that's how he's going to lie. Okay. So then we have this right here, and it says, "It shall enter in the house of the thief, and him that say, swears falsely by my name." So so there's a him. There's a specific person that's going to do this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we we have a hint that it's 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 somehow tied to the angels, but we don't have that specifically. And then it says, it will remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timbers and the stones thereof. Does that sound like anything else that you can think of related to an angel and another prophecy? Yeah. Um, in, in, in Ezekiel or when, when they were describing Satan? Uh, or, I think or, you might be right. I always get these two mixed up. There's, there's I, Isaiah, I think twenty eight and Ezekiel fourteen. And I yeah. always get mixed up. Yeah. Isaiah fourteen. Isaiah fourteen. Ezekiel twenty eight has the stones. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's Isaiah right. twenty eight then. Yeah. I, Isaiah, Isaiah fourteen, uh, and then you double it. You get Ezekiel twenty eight. That's how I remember it. Okay. Yeah, fourteen. Yeah. And 28. Okay. Nice. <laughs> I don't remember that. 
Are you sure that's the same one? No, that's the wrong one. It's got to. You know, he's talking about. I know exactly that. It's Ezekiel twenty eight is in the garden. Uh, or I'm sorry, Ezekiel twenty eight is in the garden. You were uh, a cherub, uh, a guardian cherub. Uh, yeah, that's stones what I was... and, Yeah, walking in the oh, garden. Here, here he is. Here he is. Oh, so this is Isaiah fourteen twelve. He says, "How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning?" Okay, when does Lucifer fall from heaven? Yeah. In the That's end, in Revelation, Jesus prophesied, "I saw Je Satan fall," and it's uh, Revelation twelve, the woman chasing the woman. Right, and what happens in Revelation thirteen? Mm, that's the Antichrist. Right. No, the war in heaven, right? Right. My so to see how he's down on the earth. God makes sure these him and his angels are down on the earth when this judgment's about to come. Uh. So he says, you're, you're fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in my heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Where's the mount of the congregation? Uh, sounds like Mount Zion. Yeah. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down in the sides of the pit. And then he says, okay, it's not in this one. The rest is, is in Ezekiel then. That's that's him. And that they're comparing him there to uh, the king of Babylon. And then Ezekiel 28, they can compare him to the, to the king of Tyre. Tyre. Right? So uh -huh. keep Babylon in mind because that's going to come to mind. Um, he says this, he says, take up a lamentation against the king of Tyre. You were in God, Eden, the garden of God. So he was there in the beginning. That's who tempted Adam and Eve. You, thou art the anointed cherub that covers. I've set thee so. Thou was on the holy mountain of God, and thou was walked up and down in the midst of the stony fire. Thou was perfect in all thy ways until from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. By the multi multitude of thy merchandise, they filled the midst of thee with violence. So if he's a covering, what is he covering? Uh, the oh. cherubs did the covering of the mercy seat. Uh, Adam, Adam in the earth. Right. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. So when he says the midst of thee with violence, what is getting filled with violence under his authority? Think Genesis 6. Murder. Yeah. And the earth was filled with violence, right? And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom because of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they behold me. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. Remember that? What we just read in Zechariah? And mm -hmm. it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So again, what's the midst of thee? What's filled with violence in the days of Noah? Man. Right. More specifically, what does he say? The whole earth is filled with violence, right? Uh. So the midst of thee, that means he says, when I bring fire forth from the midst of thee, where's that fire coming forth from? To devour him. The earth. The earth. When what earth does it ultimately happen? Second Peter 3, the earth burns. Right. The elements will melt with a fervent heat, right? So when you read this, this this is effectively what happens. Do we do we inherit this earth? No. no. What do we inherit? The new, new earth. earth. New earth. New earth and the new heaven. So when when Satan corrupted this earth and stole it, did God let him keep it? Yeah. No. no. Well, it's going to do a makeover, just like the flood was a makeover. Right. So he so the kingdom God kept, but the actual physical earth, he's like Satan, you can have it, but yeah, it's yeah. down, right? Yep. Uh -huh. 
So when we get to Zechariah 5, he's saying, it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber and the stones thereof. That's a that's a metaphor for the whole earth burning up because that's Satan's home, right? Uh. He made his abode on the earth. He's cast down to the earth. He wanted the earth. He coveted the earth. And so God says, fine, you can have it, but I'm going to burn it all down. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. Okay. So so that's that's your first instance of this um the, this scroll, this two-sided scroll, that's the what, okay? Now we're going to deal with the when. So the second one, remember I told you the, the top three guys who are going to be involved? We, we, we've been looking at Daniel. We've been looking at Zechariah. Who, who haven't we looked at yet? Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah. Okay. So, so now if we get to Ezekiel chapter 2, this is right up in the beginning of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel ends with the temple period in the millennium. So Ezekiel is exiled from Israel before Jerusalem is destroyed, and but they get keep getting worse under Jeremiah, if you remember. And this is what he says to him when he fi- first commissions him. He says, and he said to me, son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak to thee. And the spirit entered into me when he spoke to me, and he set me on my feet, and I heard him speak to me. And he said to me, son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even to this day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted, and I will send thee to them, and thou shalt say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, and they, when they will hear, and whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house. Oh, I'm sorry. And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there had been a prophet among them. So in other words, whether they listen or not, I'm sending this prophet. Okay? And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither afraid of their words, Though briars and thorns be with thee, and though thou dost dwell among scorpions, what are these metaphors for briars and thorns? Wheat and tares. Desolation. Desolation. Um, it goes back to Adam. He said, um, his, the, the curse, the curse, the yeah. ground shall bring forth thorns. Uh, right. And what does that represent? Works. 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 So thou dwells among works, right? The fruit of works. And thou dost dwell among scorpions. What do those represent? Demons. 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 Right? So, so that's what he's being sent towards. And he says, be not afraid of their words or dismayed, dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak words to them, whether they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are rebellious. For thou, son of man, hear what I say to thee. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat what I give thee. And behold, I looked, and the hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll was what of a book was was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was w- written within and without, just like the one in Revelation. And there was written therein lamentations, mourning, and woe. See how it's the same book? Mm-hmm. Was what's written in the other one? The, the other scroll we just read, what, what, what was written in it? Um, we had the thief and the liar. Right. Is it just him who's cursed by that? It went throughout, it went throughout the firmament. Right. So all angelic. And what else is promised to get destroyed besides him? All those who take his mark, all those who worship him, and it doesn't say that, so don't read into it. What it, when we go back to Zechariah five? What did it say was going to get burned up? Stone, timber, and stones. What do those represent? Well, stones were considered stones. Perhaps that applies to angels. No, the collective you're, angels. You're you're on the right track. We're stones and we're being built up into what? Temple. God. Temple. There you go. So what are his stones being built up into? <laughs> Another temple, a false one. A false temple, right? And when we get to the end of Ezekiel, we'll get in there because that's what everything's going after. Is the third temple the temple that God intended? Oh, the third temple the Jews will build, and it's not the Ezekiel temple. That's much larger. Right. So, 
So they're building a house. And just like we're being built up into a spiritual house, they're building up a carnal house, right? Right. So the lamentation, warning, and woe is because it's not just him who's going to be cursed. It's any who are in his house, right? Whose house are we in? Christ. Christ's house, right? How do we get put in Christ's house? Through faith, Holy Spirit. The sealing of the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. How do they get see, how do they get put in, in the Antichrist house? Taking a mark. Right. The mark is the counterfeit to the Holy Spirit. The stones and timbers that are burnt up are the counterfeit to the church. He's the counterfeit to Christ. Does that make sense? So he's literally announcing the, the, the curse on the anti-church. But in this prophecy, who's, who's Ezekiel going to? Israel. Israel, right? So he has this, this, this role that's written out on the inside and out, and in it are lamentations and woe. And he says, moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll and go speak to the house of Israel. Is he talking about spiritual Israel or carnal Israel? Um, right. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said to me, son of the man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give. Then I did eat it. And it was in my money. My mouth is honey for sweetness. Does that sound like something, something familiar? In Revelation, there's also another scroll. Right. So we're going to jump forward to that part and just, I'm going to read the rest of this real quick. He says, and he says to me, son of man, get thee out of the, get thee unto the house of Israel and speak my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of strange speech and a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Who are the people of a strange speech and a hard, hard language? Gentiles. Right. Mm -hmm. So yep. this, is after the, this, is, this is after the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Now he's going back to Israel, right? Right. Not to a people of strange speech and a hard language whose words you cannot understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened to thee. But the house of Israel will not hearken to thee, for they will not hearken unto me. Right? For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint, I have made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, for they are, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, son of man, all my words that I shall speak to thee, receive in thy heart and hear with thine ears. And go get thee of them of to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people and speak unto them and tell them, Thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear. So, in other words, whether they're listening or not, you say it. And that's Ezekiel's whole commission. It's all about like whether they listen or not, it's on you. If you don't say it because you don't think they're gonna listen, their blood's on your hands. But if you say it and they don't listen, you'll you'll be off the hook, okay. Because Ezekiel is a type of Christ. He's the type of the word here. That's why I keep calling him the son of man. So then he said, then the spirit took me up and I heard a voice behind me, a great voice of rushing saying, blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. And I heard also the noise and the wings of the living creatures that touch one another and the noise of the wheels over against them and the noise of the great rushing. So if you had read chapter one, those same four living creatures are in it. Okay. Right. And so the spirit lifted me up and took me away and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. And look at look where he takes them to. Then I came to them to this to the captivity at where's that? Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. That's the that's the modern original capital of the modern state of Israel. And this just happens to be another city named Tel Aviv. Do you do you know where do you know whose territory Tel Aviv is based in? That was Dan. Dan, right? So there just happens to be this city that Ezekiel goes to. And this is by the river Chibar. This is like somewhere in um, the region of like Babylon or, or Assyria or something like that. And the place they're in happens to be a place called Tel Aviv. And that's just, that's no joke. And then he said, and, and where I sat, I remained there astonished. How long among them? Days. Seven days. Seven days, which, which is what? Uh, a week a week tribulation Pass at the end of the seven days that the word of the lord came to me and said i have made thee a watchman in the house of israel so that's how isaiah's whole prophecy starts or i'm sorry ezekiel's so you're going to want to get around to reading the whole book of ezekiel because it's talking about all the same stuff from a different perspective but that 
scroll that he's reading, he's getting up, he's getting ready to go to the Jews who are at Tel Aviv, which is the modern capital of Dan in Israel. It just so, just so happens. And when you get to Revelation, you have in chapter 10, he's going to get this, this little book that's in the right hand of this, this angel, which is the same book that Jesus got. And he says, get, he takes it and he says, in thy belly, it shall be bitter, but in thy mouth, sweet as honey. So this is like a direct reference back to Ezekiel, right? And so he took right. the little book out of his hand and in his mouth, it was sweet as honey. And as soon as he has eaten it, his belly was bitter. So based on what we just read, what's John about to go do then? Based on what we just read in Ezekiel. Prophesy. Prophesy to Israel, right? Yeah. And so that's what he's saying. He said, say, say unto me, thou shalt prophesy again before many people's nations, tongues, and kings. So he's prophesying. Now he's directing it as, at Israel. And immediately in the chapter, you have the two witnesses testimony for three and a half years. So, so he, he's actually taken them back to the beginning of the, the seven years. Because he, if you line that up with Ezekiel, he says he's astonished for seven days after he gets this prophecy and eats this thing. And it makes his mouth, mouth sweet and his belly biller bitter so you know exactly where you are you're at the beginning of the seven years right mm -hmm. and then he's going to go forward and he's going to measure the temple and do all that stuff and that stuff's in ezekiel too so so you see these things aligning the scroll represents basically this warning and this judgment against the one who lies and swears falsely and everybody who's in his house so what he's really telling israel to do is get out of that house before God burns it down, right? Uh. So contextually, what happens about in the middle of the book of Ezekiel? Middle of Ezekiel. Come on, when Satan is cast down, Satan is destroyed? No, I'm, I'm just saying, just generally speaking, in terms of the history of when that book was written, do you know what happens around the middle of the book of Ezekiel? No. It's the time of Daniel. Uh, they get overthrown shortly after that. Right. Who gets overthrown? Uh, the uh, son or grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Handwriting's on the wall. Well, that's what happens in, to, to Babylon years later. But actually, it's Jerusalem that gets, gets destroyed about halfway through Ezekiel by Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. And who's Nebuchadnezzar a type of? And it's Antichrist. Antichrist. Right, and does he have a, does he have an image of the beast for them to worship? Yep. Oh right. yeah. And so there's, there's your hint about all this stuff that's about to go down. So, so we go back to Israel. We how are we doing on time? We eight fifty two. We're doing all right. Look at us. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so he takes the book, and that book is sealed with the seven seals thereof. Um, one of you guys want to read two through fourteen? Two to fourteen. Yep. All right. Revelation chapter two. I mean chapter five, verse two. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said, saith unto me, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and 20 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, 
For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I held, and I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, amen. And the four and 20 elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. Okay. So based on what we know is in that scroll, why do you think nobody's worthy to open it? Because they have sin. They have sin. And if we are, if if we have sin, who is in authority over us? Satan. Satan. So, what does Galatians talk about uh, uh, us being under the royal law? Before that, though, before Christ came, the bondage of sin. The bondage of yeah. sin. Mm -hmm. And Hebrews says we're in bondage of sin through the fear of death. And who has that power? Satan. Satan, right? Who administers the law? The angels. Right. And that's in Hebrews. And that's also in Stephen's speech in the book of Acts. The law right. was administered by angels. So the power of death is in the law. The law is administered by angels. Who's the chief minister of the law then? Satan. Right. So when he removed the power of death from Satan, he removed the law, right? Right. Uh, so now, once Christ fulfilled the law, a man was now adjudicated worthy to rule the earth again because he fulfilled the law, right? Uh, and so Satan, who is the steward of Gondor, right? <laughs> he, he wants to keep his stewardship. And that's why he killed Christ. Right. But he lost his stewardship. So he's weeping because nobody's found worthy to, to open the scroll. But then Jesus prevails, right? Because right. he was sinless unto death. Right. He prevailed to take back the authority of the earth. And that's why you see every creature and everything in the earth and under the earth all glorying. Because why? The, the earth groans. What does it say? For the manifestation of the sons of God. Right, because why? Why does the earth grow and wait for our redemption? Does that isn't that when Christ returns, right? To take take the what happens? What it's happens? All when, fallen. when the sons of God are all come together. That was uh, watching the earth. The, uh, it's all fallen. The whole thing's fallen, and the angels right. saw that it all go down. Are we the but, only but, but is, to to futility? Say say again. Are we the only ones in bondage to futility? No, all the creation. Because isn't it like when the the lion shall lay lay with the lamb? Right. They they're waiting to be redeemed too because everything's in chaos. Right. Everything is falling apart. Right. And so mm -hmm. the earth is waiting for us to to be redeemed so that the earth gets gets out from underneath that bondage and the earth goes back into peace. I'm reading right now the Silmarillion, which is like. Uh, the Lord of the Rings. Uh, it's like the Bible for the Lord of the Rings world, because uh -huh. they have all these different, like you know, mythologies about you know how the how how that world gets corrupt, right? Uh -huh. And I'm like, there's a kind of a truth to that because the guy was Catholic who wrote it, but it's like he's trying to reflect how Satan actually physically corrupted the world. We don't really think about all that that much, but it was like there were no thorns <laughs> in this world, right? It's like everything's breaking up, falling apart, the diseases, the rot, you know, animals killing each other, 
that, that's not even necessary for the animals to kill each other. It's not necessary for us to be killing animals. We could, we could live off vegetarians, but, but like all this bondage is in place because of sin and it, it doesn't get over until Christ's work is finished and the fullness of the body of Christ comes in. And so they're all saying, woohoo, because, now this is not the title deed of the earth, but because <laughs> he prevailed to open the scroll that allows him and also mankind to do what? Judge the earth. Right. And the angels. Right. It says, for a time, he has made him a little lower than the angels, right? Mm -hmm. uh. That it'd be later crown, crown and glory, right? Do you right. see how God just totally flipped the script? Right. Now look it's at this. A, it's basically like back to Adam and his dominion. Right. So look, look at this. Who was first between man and the angels? The angels. Who was first between Israel and the Gentiles? Israel. Who, who was first between Cain and Abel? Cain. Cain. Who was first between Ishmael and... Uh, Isaac. Isaac. Ishmael. Who was first between Jacob and Esau? Esau. Who was first between the prodigal son and his brother? His brother. His brother. So what's all this really about? The first shall be last. Amen. <laughs> See, that was always God's plan. See, that's why he's trying to get us to stop being pitted against each other. Because the one who sin originated with was who? Satan sinned Satan. first. And who did God create hell for? Satan and, Satan his, and his angels. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you go to hell with Satan, you volunteered for that. Because you trusted in Satan, who's doomed, instead of trusting in God, who offered you forgiveness. Right? Uh, uh, All that first shall be last and last shall be first stuff. It's in every single thing. Remember when Judah had two kids and the one reaches out and grabs the, or no, I'm sorry, that's Jacob and Esau. The, uh, the one reaches his arm out and they put a scarlet thread around him and he pulls it back and then the other one's born first. That's yeah, the, the deceiver. Adam. That's the first Adam and the last Adam. Yeah. So the first shall be the last shall be first, the first shall be last. And this is all about now Christ has just flipped it. Now, rather than the angels judging us, we're judging the angels. And so now the angels had a law by which to judge us, we have a law by which to judge the angels. Okay. So, and then they, he says, he says, you have slain and you have redeemed us by the blood of every, every kindred tribe, people in tongue. He's made us kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. So now we are for class, if you will, but, but, but it hasn't come yet. Christ accomplished it in his first coming. Now he's going to claim it in his second coming. But in the midst of this happening, the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So this, because these things are happening in eternity, do you see how this stretches all the way back to when Christ died the first time? Mm -hmm. And then those thrones being set up and all that stuff is going to stretch all the way to the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium. Okay. And so there's this passage right here where he says, I beheld and heard around him uh, the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Mm -hmm. So that takes us right back to Daniel 7. Daniel 7. And he says that the beast was, was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. After, right after he said, behold, the thrones are cast down. The ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, and the throne was like a fire in flame, and his, and his wheels is burning fire. Now, I think that's the father, because I think the lamb is there, and then the father's on the throne. And I, I think the ancient of days is usually referring to the father. And a fiery stream issued forth before him. Ten thousand, ten thousands ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the judgment was set, and the, the, works, the books were open. And I beheld, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, and I beheld even as the beast was slain, and his body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. So he just jumps from Revelation 4 to Revelation 20 that quick. And then, of course, now we're in the millennium right here, okay? And he says, and I saw, this is another thing, I saw in the night visions, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, 
and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. So that's the lamb going up before him. And there was given to him dominion and his dominion is an everlasting dominion. So you see how he's jumping all over in the book of Revelation because this is happening in eternity, but it's being metered out chronologically in the book of Revelations for us in time. Does that make sense? Yep. Right. Yep. So if somebody comes to you and says that that scroll is the title deed of the earth and starts talk about some ancient Roman custom, what are you going to tell them? It's judgment. Uh, on angels, we're judging them. Right. More, more, most importantly, Christ is judging them, but we're in Christ. And, right. But that is the law by which we judge angels. And the, the judgment is the bad angels got to go and the good right. angels stay. And they're our friends and servants, right? So he's. this is the true new world order. Got it? <laughs> nice. <laughs> this is the true new world order, right? And Satan's always, down. He's always oh. trying to counterfeit it, right? He's, he's just flipped Satan's whole plan upside down, okay? Wow. So, but, but, but again, he worked all that out for us to, you know, have, you know, learn mercy and learn, learn through suffering obedience like Christ, learn mercy, learn pity, learn gentleness, because we're going to rule over angels for eternity. Do you see how he wants us to have all this built-in grace by the time we start ruling other beings? Right. <laughs> Makes so, sense. So all that being said, I'm going to give you guys this pattern. And then next week, we're going to start getting into the wars. We, we That's 905. So we did really good. But he, here's your pattern. And so in Israel, you really have three big things that happen in Israel's history after the kingdom gets established. The first is going to be your Assyrian invasion. That takes northern Israel captive and almost destroys southern Israel. The second is going to be when the Babylonians, they cozy up to them and then they end up subduing them. And then when Israel rebels against them, they get judged. Jerusalem gets destroyed. And then the third is when the Persians come under Cyrus, who he calls my anointed, mm -hmm. and he lets them go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. Okay. So these same three things are going to happen in the eschaton. The first is going to be the Gog Magog invasion, which Jews and Muslims and um, pre wrath people all think is Armageddon. They're all wrong, okay? This is the Assyrian invasion, but Jerusalem is spared from the Assyrian invasion. Then they get cocky and they cozy up to, to, to uh, Babylon, and that's going to be the Antichrist in the second one. And then he turns on them, and then Jerusalem gets judged. And that's going to happen at the midpoint of the tribulation. And then, of course, after Armageddon, that last battle, the... Uh, the millennial kingdom starts and my anointed Christ has them restore the temple. So there's your basic pattern. You're going to have two wars. You're going to have Gog may Gog, then Armageddon. And you're going to have this deception in the middle of the two. Okay. Just like you're going to have the Gog may Gog war. And then you're going to have Jerusalem being sacked, but a deception between the two. And we're going to go through Isaiah, Micah, Joel, Zechariah, we're going to go through a lot of stuff to get this nailed down because there's a lot of little details here. Um, I would estimate probably three to six weeks on this. We'll just cool. see how fast we can go through it. But, um, but, but this is the real time stuff. This is what's going to happen probably between now and Daniel's 70th week beginning. So the more you learn about this, the more equipped you're going to be to be like, oh, that next headline came out. Because I've been watching this stuff now for like 10, 15 years, and it's happening like, dun, 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 and you can just see it all like lockstep happening. But I sent you guys on Facebook, I sent you all a copy of the PDFs. So if you want to look at this one right here, Understanding World War III, um, I, I gave you most of the books that you guys would have to read there. So it's like probably about 10 chapters altogether. And just start right in order. Isaiah 17 through 19, Psalm 83, Micah 5, Joel 2, Gog, Magog. Uh, just just start right in order you see them and just peck away at a chapter here and there and we'll probably probably do two or three chapters a week until we're done but it's about 10 chapters overall okay cool. and that will take us right into daniel's 70th week in the latter rain and then the, the fullness of the gentiles is in and now we're dealing with israel okay cool i had a i had a question sure uh, let's see uh 
the vision of God, the temple throne, uh, it's like we don't see the Father uh, in both in uh, in both of the visions of uh, in Daniel. Uh, is that is that true? Um, God is spirit. I think we Jesus. see a, a manifestation of the Father, kind of like Christ is the manifestation of the Father in heaven. Because he mm -hmm. does say that the Father will be there on his throne and will will dwell with him forever. So I mm -hmm. think the Father condescends in the same way that Christ condescends when he came to us in the flesh. But it's something more glorious than this, because obviously he's not in the flesh. He's still spirit. But it's almost like, you know, how these angels have a different representation in Ezekiel than they do in, in, in um, Revelation, but they're the same angels. I think mm -hmm. this one's sitting on the throne and the red and the green around him and hair like white wool. I think that is the father. Yeah, the, the cults will sometimes uh, talk about Revelation sitting on the throne and, uh, and I don't always have a good answer. Yeah, I, I just assume because the lamb is present with them that that is the father and then the seven spirits before the throne obviously is the Holy Spirit. Um, obviously, these are these are visual representations of spiritual things so the symbology is going to be pretty present i don't think necessarily god's going to look like that but he might you know he might manifest himself to us looking just like that so he he's got white hair like wool and he's got a radiance of red and green around him, apparently so maybe like santa claus but thinner uh, gandalf the what gandalf the white gandalf the white <laughs> I mean, he, he shows up like he wants to show up. It's, it's just, he's the boss. He can look like Morgan Freeman if he wants to. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so he's, you know, I think, I think in, in the eternal state, there's going to be a visible representation of the father that we can visit. That's, that's the impression that I get. And in the new Jerusalem, he's, He's a visible, at least a visible representation, maybe not flesh and blood necessarily, but there's a visible representation, but the real fullness of the glory of the father, again, just like the fullness of the glory of Jesus is kind of bottled up for him to come and dwell among us. That's how I see the visible representation of the father being in heaven or in the new Jerusalem. It's like, it's like a contained version of him, but the real version of him is this, you know, universal size, supernova slash black hole, like massive, you know, bigger and stronger and, you know, destroys everything by just showing itself. You know what I mean? Like, that's how I see the, the, the father. But, I, but again, Jesus shares that glory with him. So that is the Godhead, but they kind of send to make themselves like the, the spirit takes the form of a dove. And, you know, it's like he, the, the Godhead condescends to make themselves visible to us in a way that we can comprehend the differences between them and you know just just behold them and kind of get a get a get a feel for them i that's why i see it any other questions before we head out oh uh, well uh just a little update my um homeboy's mom